Hello Spectrum Women fans, it is I, Becca Laurie Hector here, back with another installment of Asking Spectrum Women. Hi, happy March. Uh, this is the March installment, you guys. I can't believe it. We are like just at about a year or so when um, this whole pandemic came out thing um, and when all the lockdowns started and all of that. So that's crazy, isn't it? And that nuts? I don't know. I was just thinking about that. Thought I'd share. <laughs> all right. Um, I am ready, of course, to answer your hot topic questions that you have sent me um, as this is our monthly Q&A. And so I'll just begin. Um, I really hope that you guys um, enjoy my answers, my attempt at answering some of your questions, and I do hope that they're helpful. Um, so let's get going. Here we are. All right. Um, first question. Um, how can I stop falling prey to small-minded, toxic people who play head games with me and rob me of my equanimity? Why do I never see them coming? When will I ever learn to not be so naive? And how do I stop being pissed off with myself for allowing myself to get duped yet again? Um, great, great question. Um, actually, this question was sent to me for last month, didn't make it in. And so this one's squeaking in. And what ended up happening is um, I ended up really thinking about how to answer that question. And as a result, um, I have spent the last like three weeks or four weeks uh, on my live stream talking about the answer to this very question. Um, because what got me thinking about, you know, if I'm going to give this advice about avoid, you know, how do we not fall victim to this? How do we do that? Part of it is that we need to first recognize toxic people. And what I realized was that uh, in doing some research is that, um, all of the information out there about recognizing toxic people is of course built for a neurotypical brain by a neurotypical brain. And that doesn't help us as autistics. Um, we don't seem to see those things. And so much so that I went through um, a couple, uh, an article that talked about um, toxic behaviors, toxic, you know, the behaviors of toxic people and talked about how we don't see those things. Um, and then actually I just finished doing another live stream um, which talks about our now new compiled list of traits that I think autistic people can use to find the toxic people in their life. Um, and so what I'm going to say is my answer to this question is head over to my YouTube channel, which is YouTube Becca Lori, Doc, Becca Lori Hector or whatever it is. Um, you search my name, my YouTube will come up. I'll, I'll stick it. It's usually in a link in the description anyway. You can just go to the description of this video um, and click the link and you'll find three videos, part one and part two, the, the murky waters of toxic people, as well as um, uh, a third part, which is called identifying toxic people as an autistic. Those three live streams are the answer to this question question. Um, but the piece that we didn't really talk about is how to break that habit of um, that negative self-talk. So what happens for us is that because the behaviors that toxic people display aren't things that our brain necessarily picks up, we miss toxic people all the time. And so it's not um, something that we should be mad at ourselves for. What we need to do is figure out a way to find these toxic people in a way that does work for us. And that's what we've done. Um, and so what you need to do is, is make a habit of trying to identify the toxic people in your life earlier, right? And how to find them, right? And that's part of not falling victim to them. And the other thing is remember that they're doing this with intention of, um, fooling you. I mean, the part of it is, is, is the falling for it is that the people fall for it. So it's to know that they um, are out there doing that manipulation. And if you fall for it, that's not your fault, right? Um, what is in control is how you recover from those fall downs with people, how you get back up from um, that um, falling for it yet again. So you have to get better at you know, figuring them out. And we also have to remember that it's not our fault if we fall for it. That's my two-sided answer to it. Other than please go over and, and check out those three live streams because that was a really in-depth answer to this question. Um, Okie doke. Moving right along. Next question. Um, I'm 47 and it wasn't until a recent article emphasized a high comorbidity between autism and Ehlers-Danos, Danner's syndrome. I say this wrong every time, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, EDS, um, that I began looking at autism. The more I look at it, the more I believe to my core that I have autism, but I can't seem to even get a doctor to examine me. They just 
they just dismiss me. The like, this is likely won't surprise you, but the last licensed medical professional I asked to explore this with me said it was a waste of my time because I don't have it. I asked why he was so sure, and he said autistic people don't have bigger, autistic people have bigger heads, and you don't, so you can't have it. Oof. Weird. Okay, so uh, where is a good place for women in my shoes to start to get help, and is there anything I can be doing for myself until I find someone who is willing to me help, help me? If you covered this before and I missed it, I'm sorry. I'm digging through your material. No worries. Okay, here we go. Let's talk about this. So, um, first of all, this whole idea about autism and bigger heads, it's really interesting. I don't think we've ever found any research that actually shows it to be true. Um, but there was some belief by doctors that uh, children with autism had bigger heads as babies, like our, proportionally, right? Our heads were larger. Don't know if that's true. Um, I don't really think it is. We haven't really seen it become a truth and a way to to look at autism in any way. So I kind of let that one go. And I would really let that medical professional go. Wow, what an old way of thinking. Um, so here's a couple of things that I have to say about this. Um, no, I'm not surprised. Um, and we hear this kind of dismissive behavior from medical professionals all the time. Here's the deal. Medical professionals do not diagnose autism. Um, we are either looking for a, like um, someone who does um, anything with neurology, maybe might be diagnosing autism, but mostly we're looking at psychiatrists and psychotherapists that are doing the evaluations and um, the diagnosis. So my first thing for you is stop going to medical professionals. Just stop. They, that's not where you get your diagnoses from anyway. And so many of them, as you can see, don't continue on with education and keep up with the changing of times, whereas therapists and psychiatrists really must. The next thing that you're going to be looking for when you want to pursue this um, in terms of a diagnosis is to look for someone doing your evaluation that has experience diagnosing both adults and women. That is what you're looking for um, that is really really important if they don't have that experience likely they will miss you okay and it'll be a waste of your time and money so that's the other thing that you're looking for places to begin um, first of all I would tell you to begin and first really decide whether um, it would be impactful for you to get a formal diagnosis so um, in adulthood when we get a formal diagnosis it's not usually covered by insurance which means it's out-of-pocket pay and very expensive and the other piece of it is there's not really much that you get back from your diagnosis so there's not much out there in terms of support for adults that you'll be really be receiving receiving for what you've paid for this formal diagnosis. I really recommend a formal diagnosis in adulthood if you as a person need it, meaning if you need it for yourself. So a lot of people self-diagnose. I think right now in the world, self-diagnosis is absolutely valid. There is not enough reason and cause and not enough money in the world to necessarily make it so that a diagnosis is accessible to everybody, okay? Um, and it also doesn't get you much these days. If it, Until it does, I really don't know that um, it's necessary to get one. Did I get one? Yes, I did. Why? Because I didn't trust myself anymore. By the time I had stumbled upon autism as a possible cause for a lot of the struggles in my life, um, I no longer trusted myself. And so even though I believed it to be true, I needed the reassurance of hearing it from somebody else. I needed the reassurance of that diagnosis. And so it was worth it for me. And it was really expensive. Um, so think about that part too before you go ahead and um, chase a diagnosis. Sorry, my dogs are rocking. There they go. Somebody must be home. Maybe. I don't know. Apologize for that. Anyway, um, so that's the other part of um, diagnosis. Um, what I would tell you to do is head out and look for your fellow autistic women. We are out there. The place to start would be right here, um, spectrumwomen.com. We have a, lots of articles, lots of people you can talk to, lots of mentors you can reach out to, um, and plenty of information to get you started right at the Spectrum Women website. Other places you can look is the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. They have great information for women. I don't know where you're located. Um, so if you're in the United States, I would say um, those are the resources that I would stick to. Thinking Person's Guide is also another great place you can head to um, uh, when we're talking about early diagnosis. Um, look for us. We're out there. We have the group Spectrum Women Connect on Facebook that you can reach out to your fellow, fellow uh, autistic women there as well. Um, but I do a little thinking about that diagnosis before you rush off to get it. But I also um, would 
absolutely ignore all of the medical professionals that have blown you off thus far. I would just ignore them um, and head out and do your own research. Um, so that's my advice around that. Um, I hope that helps. If you need more information, of course, you have my email and you're more than welcome to reach out, of course, for more resources, um, more specific to where you live or something like that, because I don't have that information. Here we go. Moving on. Uh, okay, a question about friendships. I'm really struggling with this one in a grieving sort of way. Realizing the long-term friendships that I have are based on me not being me. Um, <clears throat> that they were formed as a result of me morphing into them and being a follower. Me being just desperate to be accepted and liked. Now as I am becoming more authentic and open about my identity and what I like and don't like, I feel my friends pulling away. It makes me scared that I will lose them. I revisit my beliefs that I am bad for not trying hard enough and that I'm a bad friend. I feel sadness and a sense of loss and grief, realizing that my friends like the fake me better than the real me. My question is, how do I process through this space in a healthy, non-judgmental way, not demonizing them or myself for what it is? I tend to get tripped up and revert back to old thinking patterns. Love this question. Okay, here's the deal. When we decide to get on the change train, when we decide we are going to do things about our life, make changes and accept ourselves for who we are, take in our diagnosis and make changes surrounding that diagnosis and our authentic selves, change happens. It should be. You are evolving and changing as a person. What that means for the people in, around us is they either get on the change train and they love you for who you are becoming or they don't get on the change train and they wave bye-bye to you, okay? And that's part of the journey. As we evolve, we grow out of and into friendships and relationships. Um, and so, yes, is there a grieving process? Absolutely. Should you have to lose those friends? No. But you are going through a change and you are changing. And with that, that means that that camaraderie has to either evolve with you or it has to go right? That's part of the evolution. Are you allowed to grieve those friends? Yes. Are you um, allowed to be sad that they didn't decide to hang on for the ride? Yes. Um, but that's not something that's in your control. That is their choice. Your choice is um, to decide who it is that you want to be, how it is that you want to be living, chasing this authentic self, right? And then you get to decide who gets to come along for the ride. And somebody who is not prepared to evolve with you is not somebody that you need along for the ride. Um, you get to not necessarily dismiss them, but I would say section them off to an outer part of the bubble, right? Because they are not, and here's the key, they are not in alignment anymore with the life that you want to be living and who you want to be, right? And what happens to everything that's not in alignment with who you want to be and the life that you want to be living is it goes by the wayside as you are pursuing this authentic self, right? Um, and that may mean people, that may mean situations and environments, um, where you get your hair cut, all kinds of other things can be changing. Um, and what you have to remember is that these things need to stay in alignment with you as you are evolving. You are the thing that's in motion and changing, not these other things or other people. So as you're evolving, they are either along for the ride and on the change train or they're not. And that's the piece that you need to be thinking about. Um, you get to be sad about that. You get to be sad that they don't that they haven't decided to go on the ride with you of evolution. That they too don't want to evolve in their lives, um, and that um, you won't be having them in the same space as you've had them. All of that is okay to be sad for. None of that is for you to do the blame game about. Um, that is, you are changing. You are growing, and because you are recognizing old habits and not wanting to do them, that is proof that you are evolving and growing and moving forward. Um, but what's happening is everybody's not jumping on the train with you and that's okay. Um, they may ca catch up with you later on in the journey. They may uh, not. But what you need to know is that what happens when we let go of what we have is that it opens our hands up for something we don't yet know, right? So while these friends may be um, passing out of your life, there are new friends on the horizon for you that are going to be more in alignment with the life that you want to be living. Um, it's a part of life. We go through this process of, of changing friends throughout our lives. And as we do that, um, we grow as people. And I want you guys to think about that stuff. Um, that is um, really important. 
this this question about friendships and, and changing friendships as we evolve and grow. But what's important is not to beat yourself up for it, not to fall into the negative self-talk game. Um, we don't want to be doing that. Um, that is a big, big, big old mistake. So with that, I say let's move on to our very last question. Here we go. Here we go. Last question. Um, when I interact with medical people, I have this practice script of what I say and address, but it almost always gets stuck behind a paywall and a smiling mannequin version of me takes over. Like, uh, like the authentic me goes mute. My words don't feel like mine and later reflect that I didn't feel in control of my mouth hole and what came out of it. It's not dissociation because I'm present, but I'm unable to ex access the words I want to express. It's not an issue at all if I type the words. It's gotten so much worse over the years that I have complete distrust in my mouth speak. I hope this makes sense. Well, it does. Um, we used to call this selective mutism. We now call it situational, so rather situational mutism, because this is what happens for us. In certain situations, we find ourselves becoming mute, unable to access the words that we want to say. And so in a world where everyone's expected within a certain amount of time to process and participate in a conversation, it forces us to become mannequin-like, to go into these robot-like scripts of ourselves in order to stay normal in the conversation, right? And we, that's a, a piece of masking that we do. Um, and we do do it with medical professionals, I think, a lot because they make us nervous, right? Um, the thing is, we are vulnerable when we're in the doctor's office. We're usually nervous about what's wrong with us or what may be wrong with us. Um, and we are dealing with people who are usually in a hurry. They're always in a hurry. Their clients are always waiting. Everybody's always wanting them to be pulled in different directions. And so we feel like we need to be able to, to communicate our needs in the medical world fast as well. Um, and that puts even more pressure on us. Um, in addition to that, many of us already have had trauma in a medical setting and so we bring that PTSD type feelings of trauma with us to every time we have another um, situation with a medical professional. So there are a couple of things you can do to get around this. I find them helpful. One is the fact that you already noticed that it doesn't happen for you in terms of texting. So you can do a couple of things. You can type up a letter that says the things that you want to say and bring it with you. Um, you can rely on some more of your text to communicate, right? You can text, write things down for yourself and read from your texts right to the doctor as an answer. So you can pre-answer some things, right? And read from that from those lists. Um, and the other thing I recommend, especially um, for autistics uh, on the spectrum and, and for other folks who are neurodivergent as well, is bringing somebody with you um, to your appointments. Because when I get nervous, I tend to forget the things that they're saying to me, right? And I am not as coordinated because I'm nervous, so I can't really write things down. And all kinds of stuff can happen. Um, and bringing someone with you just to be a passive listener can often relieve a lot of the anxiety that um, comes with these appointments. So that's the other thing I recommend um, in terms of doctors. But use what you know. Know that you can um, bring pre-written things down with you, that you can read from a text if you need to, that you can, um, you know, use that ability that you have to prepare a little bit. Um, and know that the anxiety is going to come so that when it does come, you use your tools. Right. So when it arrives, you don't forget. Yes, I've written it down. I did things to prepare for myself and I'm allowed to read off of this text if I need to. Um, those are things you can do for yourself um, so that we don't become this this passive um, kind of along for the ride person and just trying to get out of the doctor's office, because that's how we deprive ourselves of deprive ourselves of the best care possible. Um, so those are some of my suggestions for, for dealing with that medical situation. If you need more suggestions, please feel free to go ahead and email me. I will do my best to provide you with some more resources. Um, and that's it for me, you guys. That is March Asking Spectrum Women. Um, I, as always, will need your questions for April. So please feel free to comment with your questions wherever you see this video or email me directly at info at 
BeccaLaurie.com. Um, I collect your questions and I get to them in the order that they appear to me. Um, so go ahead and send me your questions for April because I'll, I'll be already collecting right? Because it'll be here before we know it. So uh, you guys go ahead and have an amazing March. Do what you do. I hope that the answers to your questions um, have been helpful. And if you have any more, please send them my way. Have a good one, you guys. I'm Becca Laurie Hector, and I am out of here.